What I would like to do to you today is to introduce to this technology I've been spending so many years on. Already in the 1980s, we published the work, first work where we found the words WAC, and then by that time I was working with antibodies on the shoulder. There. So what I would like to focus today is on that we have found one home for the technology, which I think is in drug discovery and fragment screening. And I will focus on that. So the first thing is we are dealing with weak interactions. That's why we call it weak affinity chromatography. But weak is not really good in a way. You know, I had a problem with, I'm not the marketing guy. You know, weak is bad. We don't want that. We want strong binding. Mm -hmm. So we don't use the word so much weak anymore. We just more, more use the word transient. And that covers better what it's all about. And <clears throat> what is a weak interaction? Everything is relative, as Einstein said. You know, weak uh, typically is something I consider is a dynamic interaction when you have appreciable off rates, you know, dynamic interaction. That means we have affinities around maybe from, you know, a millimolar range up to micromolar, or even beyond that. Then we go into more strong traditional affinities. A typical drug binding to a receptor, isn't that around a nanomolar binder or something? I've seen the statistics somewhere. So we are covering then the range of weaker interactions. And as you know, uh, interactions uh, are determined by the speed constants, you know, the on rates and off rates and things. I'm, I won't go into so much on the details of the mathematical expressions on that. And just looking at the interactome, you know, all the interactions that are in, in, for example, in biological cells, there is enormous amounts. And we are just touching upon, you know, all these universe of interactions. And most of them that are characterized these days are based on one that you can see easily. That means strong interactions. But if you look on the dynamic aspects, you know, I can move. That means, you know, everything's dynamic, everything. We have so much of transient interactions out there. And maybe, you know, maybe 90, 90 frame percent of the whole interactome. Well, that perspective is undisclosed today. So there's a whole world of, of interactions there. And here's an old picture I worked with Professor Clint Kemps many years ago. He did this illustration actually for a company. Have you heard about that called Biocar? It was many years in one of the big startups in the or uh, uh, dealing with carbohydrates. So he did this little cartoon about interactions. And many of these, when I'm dealing with weaker interactions that been related to carbohydrates, because carbohydrates bind very weakly to a lot of different targets. So we have many examples of that. Virus interact with its target, bacteria, lectin, which are sugars that bind, uh, which are proteins that bind sugars, antibodies binding weakly, its target, you know, the early immune response, uh, IgM response, for example, consistent with multiple weak interactions. So, to illustrate weak interactions in a way, this is a very important principle. Is is my coverage I have when I play tennis because I have tennis arm. <laughs> so, have you heard about what's this in Swedish? It's called the Velcro cardboard band that was discovered many years ago as an invention by the Swiss, uh, I think. Um, uh, engineer George de Mestral that was out with his dog in the mountains of Switzerland and found the birds hanging on to its clothes and, and dog and so he went to the microscope and saw all these hooks and loops sitting to each other and I think this is a good illustration of weak interactions working in concert and why is this so popular? Well, it's easy to release multiple interactions and you can dynamically decide how much of interaction, if you're sitting tighter, it's harder to pick off. This is a very important biological principle. Concerting interaction, multiple interactions, and each of these hook loop is a very weak one. High millimolar, or even, you know, <laughs> molar binding. And I think it's a good illustration of what we are dealing with. This is one important biological principle. Another important, important biological principle is that high concentration, you hit very hard your receptors like this instead of having one that's tightly bound. So these, so it's a whole world and I need to actually work more 500 years on, you know, to discover itself more of the weak interactions. Here's one illustration. <clears throat> uh, 
rolling of cells. You know what the inflammation sign, if you want like to recruit white blood cells to specific sites with uh, bacteria attacking and so, and this is governed, uh, the white blood cells are in the bloodstream of course, but they have to be recruited outside. So they need to, to get to that site through directive uh, movement. And this, it's covered by the selectins, uh, which are uh, lectins that bind very weakly sugar components on the surface of white blood cells. So, dynamic multiple interaction, because it's needed, the white blood cells are going too fast, they need to roll, start getting from a jet plane to, to a helicopter mood, and then when they are there, then they can land and go outside the vessel wall. And here's an experiment, it's not a fancy video, where we have actually have these selectines in a petri dish, and we have white blood cells there, and see if you can see them going through that, and if they can roll. So, you see here, many of these white blood cells are now in getting close to the selectines and start to roll, slow down, to get into landing mode. Here it's a good example of taking advantage of multiple weak interaction to get there. So we did this uh, many years in collaboration with Lynch up in University. So I've been dealing all my life with weak interactions basically, and today we're gonna focus then on fragment screening and using a WAC technology for screening. I've been doing a lot of other things relating to weak interactions. Just gonna mention one example we have done with biosensors, because one of the consequences of weak interactions is it's dynamic, that means it's bound, that the thing that's bound onto something is completely related to the concentration of that. That means that we can make continuous sensors. For example, we have a Danish company develop a glucose sensor to continuously measure the glucose concentration because it's a weak dynamic interaction. Typically, if you have a strong interaction, then you're stuck with that and you have to loop. Then we're going to see it clearly with um, the example somewhere later. One of the areas I would like to discuss with you in the future is, of course, a concept I call transient drugs. You know, why, why have drugs to be nanomolar? You know, there are examples of a lot of drugs that are nanomolar, that are mild. But I think purposely maybe make drugs that are more weakly. Going from the magic bully concept of Paul Alish to the magic shotgun, for example, where you can hit multiple targets instead of one. And maybe the hypothesis is that it's gonna be weaker in seeing interaction to the target. So, traditional affinity curve, and you have all done chromatography, or you know what that is. And traditional affinity chromatography, then you have a high binding, and here's one example, we have them immobilize the target. For example, it could be a strong antibody towards an antigen. And then you apply that on a column, and you have it immobilized, and you then apply the whole mixture onto it. And see what's happening there. So, You see, when they're moving along the column, the ones that are really tight binders are going to be basically stuck on the column. All others are eluded earlier on. Here we have an example in the front, for example, and maybe something that are, well, binding, but we don't consider it specifically. Maybe we're going to discuss that later. What, what is a specific interaction? So in this case, it's not, it's sitting there, and we have to elude it. And we loot it by different means, low pH, high salt, temperature, all of that. And it's coming, you know, you know, if it's steel, it's not a covalent bond, of course, it's a tight binder. That means if we, this will actually loot somewhere two months from now, but where it, where it loot it. So we can't wait for that. So we actually uh, <clears throat> elute them by changing from high affinity to low affinity. So what is weak affinity then? Weak affinity chromatography basically we're gonna run it more weaker instead of having this high binding. Affinity chromatography was coined by, by Coate Casas Amplis and Wilshek in 1968. They consider it as a chromatography technique. The tight binding is more of an extraction technique. It's not really chromatography. Chromatography for me is where you actually take something that 
the loads differently along the axis of the column. So in this case, we have a weak monoclonal antibody, or we have a receptor uh, of some kind. And then we just apply it, and they are then now just moving differently, retarded differently according to the affinity of the system, and coming off nicely from the column, eluting at different times, depending on how strongly they bind to the toy. And now we're talking weak interactions, micromolar to millimolar, typical range. Can you, can you follow me? So, so that very simple principle, isn't it? Oh, yes. So when they come to me, why? I mean, it's so obvious. Why hasn't it been done before? Well, because we are traditionalists. You know, we are brought up with a paradigm. And the paradigm of affinity chromatography is that it's a strong binding and we have to lose it. And I come from another, uh, you know, from, from the more separation uh, society and realize that you know, we can do this. So, it's to summarize then, a tight binder is coming very late, or even not coming at all. A weaker binder is eluting, and you can see them one by one. Basically, the retention you have here will give you the affinity. I'm just gonna show one formula on that. And the spreading of the peak gives you the kinetic. Very simple. So that, that's the whole thing. Very simple, isn't it? But of course, there are problems. The first work I did this is back in 1990, or even a little earlier. I was working in an antibody in collaboration with carbohydrate chemistry. And I you know, got some antibodies they didn't want to have. It went into the waste basket and picked it up because they were too weak. We can't use them for ELISAs or, or other assays. So I put that in a column, that antibody. And then we applied a sugar sample, maltose, here in serum, because I want to play that situation on you know, a crude extract with some sugar. You know. And it came out then with two peaks. And I thought immediately this is something wrong, you know, two peaks or one molecule, no, it doesn't work. But I was not a carbohydrate chemist. <laughs> and I realized, because it was strange, it changed according to the time you dissolve the sample and so. So what happened when the carbohydrate said, oh boy, maybe you are looking at the anomers of maltose, you know, the alpha beta anomers, and you can separate them. It's a crafty. So, and that was true. So that, that was the illustration we did in 1980. And for me, this was a proof of concept that we can do this. And then we tried also with very weak interactions. You know, here is one weak interaction at 800 association concept, you know, very weak. So that was, for me at least, the proof of concept. And we continue to work, we work with a lot of different lectins, and here you just, I will be illustrating an example from LECT 2001, PhD student with me by that time, uh, where we actually can separate a lot of different sugars according to the affinity, so you see? Now we have real chromatography. It's not on and off. So we did that, and but I have a problem now. I have I'm holding my entrepreneurship courses in in Singapore, and what I've learned there the hard way is first you have to define the problem, <laughs> and then you offer a solution to the problem. I came with this technology, there was no problem to solve, you know. It was just um, a discovery, you know, that you can just use this type. So I had a problem. Nobody was interested, you know, for any big reasons about these sugars and so but it was a good illustration. So, in, it was it now back in 2010 around, and I don't remember Leonard who came up with the original idea, maybe we should try, have you heard about fragment screening? I never heard about it, what is that? And uh, haven't you read this guy by Fesik and uh, Hagdo Shuk in, in NMR? 1995, was it, you want, uh, in science? You know, that 
you know, dealing with small organic molecules that are weak, it's binding. I thought, oh boy, this is maybe something we can apply for WAC. So we started in Kalmar, well, by then working in Kalmar at the University of Kalmar, now Linnaeus University, and thought, okay, maybe I have an application for the thinking. I've been working for so many years. So, and, and you know, fragment, I don't have to go into the details of that, but it, you know, you have to know, it's, you have to develop something where you can characterize very weak binders, don't you? And it could be so weak, so it's, you have to work maybe with a fragment that's made of older because that's the only one you found. So we, then we started to work with that. So here is just a list of all different types of assays we're doing for fragment screening these days. And I'm trying now to add a new kid on the block. Why for fragment screens? 